On April 22, 1980, 13 top True Whig officials were executed on Monrovia Beach under the full glare of TV cameras and the viewing public. A jubilant atmosphere engulfed indigenous Liberians after the coup, and the whole country was swept up in a carnival atmosphere. This was their liberation from 133 years of settler domination. They felt that the day to enjoy the full right of citizenship in their own country had come. They thought that their needs and interest which had been long overlooked would now claim the full attention of their new government. But, they were about to find out just how wrong they were. Samuel Doe was born in a small town called Tuzon in the southeastern part of Liberia on May 6, 1951. Having come from humble beginnings as with most indigenous Liberians, he was only able to complete his primary school education before enlisting into the Liberian army at 18 years of age. He distinguished himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat and he was a highly skilled marksman. Exhibiting remarkable leadership capabilities, Doe in 1979 was selected to be trained by United States Special Forces in Liberia, and within a year was promoted to Master Sergeant. Not long after resuming office, Doe began to deviate from his stated rationale for taking power. Subsequent events would reveal that Doe's regime was both self-serving and opportunistic. Corruption became rife, and the economy collapsed, and all forms of opposition was suppressed. Doe and his officials illegally acquired wealth and land as blatantly as the true Whigs once did. Human rights abuses became rampant under his regime and he intimidated the press by fining and imprisoning journalists. Within four years, Doe in 1984 had eliminated all potential rivals and remained unchallenged at the pinnacle of Liberian politics. He offered to return Liberia from military dictatorship to civilian rule. Much to the surprise of Liberians, Samuel Doe, who by now had promoted himself to the rank of general, founded the National Democratic Party of Liberia and announced his intention to contest for office. <laughs> A week before the elections, Doe ordered all civil servants to prove membership of the NDPL, if they wanted to retain their jobs. In his words, the real meaning of democracy is to give jobs to somebody who can promote you. The elections were as unfree as they were unfair. As Liberians awaited the results, he ordered his soldiers to flog or arrest anyone insulting him or predicting opposition victory. Nobody stood a chance. By 1986, Samuel Doe had metamorphosed from a shy skeletal master sergeant, to a plump and confident civilian president. He traded in his military fatigues for smartly tailored three-piece suits. He was now to be addressed as Dr. Doe, after receiving an honorary doctorate degree from the University of South Korea. His dictatorial tendency however had only gotten worse. Murder, torture and imprisonment became normal instruments of national policy. There was a growing resentment among Liberians, and several opposition groups attempted to overthrow Doe's regime without any success. After the 1980 coup, many African states withheld diplomatic recognition from the Doe regime. 
ECOWAS states like Nigeria, Côte d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone and Burkina Faso were critical of Doe's assassinations following the coup. Nigerian President Shehu Shagari expressed his country's displeasure at Doe's coup by closing its embassy in Monrovia. Sierra Leone President Joseph Momo allowed his territory to, to be used to launch an unsuccessful coup against Doe in 1985. Ivorian leader Felix Ufwe Boini had a more personal axe to grind with Doe. His adopted daughter Daisy was married to the slain president, William Talbot's son, Adolphus Talbot. On 14 June 1980, Doe's men dragged the younger Talbot out of the French embassy where he went to seek refuge, and locked him up. Despite Ufwe Boini's personal plea to spare his life, Doe's men executed Adolphus Talbot and refused to return any of Talbot's assets to his widow. The Ivorian leader would never forgive Doe for this act. His early isolation and humiliating battle for recognition by African leaders had left deep scars. Doe gazed beyond the shores of Africa for diplomatic support, and eventually, came to rely almost entirely for his regime's survival on Liberia's oldest ally, the United States of America. The United States extended financial aid to Doe's regime from less than $20 million to almost $500 million by 1985. They also included assistance with interest payment on foreign debt, supplies of stable foods such as rice, and military aid. Doe's troops were trained by the United States, which also built new barracks and supplied uniforms, weapons and trucks. At the time of the coup, the United States had 3,000 citizens in Liberia and private investments of $350 million, Firestone, Goodrich and Uniroyal had rubber plantations. Doe in return closed the Libyan mission in Monrovia and terminated diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, while establishing relations with the State of Israel. For this reasons, it was expected that the United States would step in to restore order in Liberia, but this did not happen. In the era of Cold War, the United States' strategic interest in Liberia appeared to be more important to Washington than did niceties about human rights and democracy. By 1987, the Reagan administration was deeply embroiled in the Iranian-Contra scandal. The Cold War was coming to an end, and military assistance to sub-Saharan Africa was drastically reduced. Doe was forced to turn to countries like Israel, Romania and South Korea for arms. With the crumbling of the Berlin Wall, and the end of the Cold War, Africa's relevance had diminished and Doe had become a political orphan. He had outlived his strategic usefulness to Washington. Liberians, who identified with Americans more than they did with their West African neighbors seemed traumatized by the United States' apparent lack of interest in the Liberian conflict. Having spilled so much blood and made so many enemies in his rise to the top, a bloody end seemed like a predictable outcome for Doe. Even as Liberia's economy tottered on the brink of total collapse by the end of 1989, a political crisis of catastrophic proportions loomed just over the horizon. But who could stop Samuel Doe? The president Doe, here is the dad, eh? He has been caught. Doe has been caught. Cassie Doe! Yo, Cassie Doe! Cassie Doe! Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we, we arrested Doe in a very cool, cool and intelligent manner as commandos. As Liberians prepared for Christmas on 24th of December 1989, a band of 168 armed men, calling themselves the National Patriotic Front of Liberia crossed into Liberia from Côte d'Ivoire. Their express purpose was to topple the regime of Samuel Doe. The leader of this guerrilla force was, Charles Taylor, a former ally of the embattled dictator. Doe scrambled to control the situation by broadening his political base. As US and European civilians were being evacuated from Monrovia, Doe went to Lagos on 7 May 1990 to ask his friend General Ibrahim Babangida, for assistance. Returning quickly to Monrovia, Doe was besieged in his executive mansion with a battalion of his AFL troops. The beleaguered leader, downed gallons of French brandy, even as his country burned around him.
By September 9, 1990 Samuel Doe was captured by Prince Johnson's forces. He was stripped naked, brutally tortured and eventually executed in a recorded video, considered, too gruesome for broadcast. His body was severely mutilated and his lifeless corpse paraded around Monrovia. Doe's execution however was not the end of Liberia's crisis, it only marked the beginning of even more troubling times for Liberians ahead. So who did not tell you say you for fat? Who did not say you for kill? So you don't kill anybody for we begin fat? Yes, I don't call time. I don't kill for food.